Hello Hello, Marco. Do you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so first the chair will introduce you and then the floor is yours. Okay? Thank you. All right, so our next speaker we can see is Dr. Marco Henskin, Assistant Professor in Global Sustainable Development at the University of Warwick. Um, looking at uh, mixed methods development studies and uh, focusing geographically on Asia and thematically on human behavior and policy implementation in the context of marginalization and societal and technological change. So without further ado, I'll let Marco take it away. Thank you. Um, I will share my screen so that you can see the slides. So just tell me if you can see uh, the first slide now. Okay, perfect. Okay, then I will get started right away. Um, first of all, thank you again for inviting me and sorry for not being able to attend in person um, because of logistical challenges, but it's nonetheless a pleasure to be with you, even if it is virtually, and I hope um, I can share some of my insights that are hopefully informative for you and that we can discuss them afterwards. So I understand we have 20 minutes for presentation and then 10 minutes for discussion, um, which is what I'm going to work around approximately. This presentation is um, basically a summary of uh, five research papers. Five research papers came out in connection with a clinical trial of biomarker testing um, to reduce antibiotic prescriptions for fever in Southeast Asia. I will focus on one paper in particular, um, but I will give you a broader overview of what we found. The paper that I'm going to focus on is titled here. Uh, it's published in Social Science Medicine. It's on the social role, the social context of this biomarker test that we tried, um, C-reactive protein testing. Uh, and this one focuses specifically on Northern Thailand, Chiang Rai, but we will expand our ge geographical scope during the presentation. But first, the reason why, uh, why the clinical trials, which were led by UL Lubel, um, were focused on Southeast Asia, um, one of the main reasons is that antibiotic use in the context of antimicrobial resistant antibiotic use is uh, considered very high in Southeast Asia, and Southeast Asia is considered an epicenter for AMR. The situation is a bit mixed, especially on primary care levels, but by and large it's, it's high overall, though Thailand recently has made some progress in using antibiotic prescriptions um, compared to its neighboring countries. So Thailand is nowadays considered a poster child even in terms of antimicrobial stewardship in Southeast Asia. But aside from, uh, from the high levels of antibiotic use in this region, generally speaking, um, there's also a problem in terms of diagnosing fevers. Now, fever diagnosis in the context of malaria is re relatively well developed. Rapid diagnostic tests are widely available, but I think um, Professor Hopkins today already shared with you some information that in the context of non-malaria cases, non-malaria fevers, diagnostic options are rather limited and might often involve than prescribing antibiotics when uh, antimalarials are not being provided. Uh, that's an issue across the board in low middle-income countries uh, and also in Southeast Asia. Now, the problem is compounded generally by the lack of uh, diagnostic kit in primary care settings in Southeast Asia, um, diagnostic tests in particular, uh, to support clinical decision-making. So clinical trials were devised by people other than me um, to uh, to help frontline healthcare workers, doctors and nurses who prescribe antibiotics to, uh, uh, to make more uh, accurate decisions as to whether or not to prescribe an antibiotic. The point of care tests that were trialed in this particular context were C-reactive protein point of care tests. Um, it's a biomarker that can give information as to whether or not a fever, for instance, has likely a bacterial cause or a non-bacterial cause. So if C levels are high, then a healthcare worker could be advised to prescribe an antibiotic. If, health, if CRP levels are low, then healthcare workers might be advised to not prescribe an antibiotic. Um, the, finger, uh, the, the point of care test was tried through a finger prick test, which took five minutes and can be deployed at a point of care in the primary level without 
any further laboratory equipment. Um, and so it was tried with 2,410 fever patients to see whether this actually helps to reduce and target antibiotic prescriptions. Turned out it does. Um, what you can see in this slide and this graph basically says that antibiotic prescriptions have reduced slightly, but especially they have been more targeted. So patients with high levels of CRP who will likely have a bacterial infection uh, turned out to be more likely to receive an antibiotic consequently and vice versa. But alongside this clinical trial, and this is what this presentation is about, uh, alongside this clinical trial, we also carried out quite extensive social research. We wanted to understand what's the context really in which we introduce uh, this this new diagnostic technology, and how does it now change the interaction with patients and the health system, and in particular healthcare workers? For this purpose, we carried out interviews and focus group discussions with patients and healthcare workers, doctors and nurses, and um, in both cases, we included uh, groups who were and who were not exposed to this biomarker test, so as to have a bit of a control group setting, as it were. Anyway, overall, we collected 85 hours of interview material, which translates roughly into 940,000 words of qualitative, qualitative stuff that we, uh, that we collected and analyzed from 92 participants. This has led to, uh, uh, to quite a bit of publication activity on our site. Um, papers that you can see here are now all uh, accepted. The last one has just been accepted last weekend. Uh, it should be available open access very soon. Um, but at the end of this presentation, you also have my email address, so you can request these papers directly from me if you'd like. I will focus specifically on the first one, but I will draw on, uh, as I mentioned, all studies that we carried out. Well, let's start with the main study in Thailand, um, where, we, uh, uh, where we analyzed the behavior of patients, healthcare workers, and how the test, the biomarker test at a, at a point of care, then uh, influences this relationship between them. The first point is uh, is to look at the uh, uh, at the treatment seeking behavior and the conceptions of illness amongst the patients, the fever patients who were enrolled in the study. Now, the very first observation that we made uh, and it struck us um, uh, very strongly was that the uh, language around antibiotics and the conceptions around fever were quite different from what we expected. People don't people in our target population hardly ever use technical terms for antibiotics, for instance. In Thai, there would be yabatiji wana, but it's like speaking Latin to people. Rather, they used vernacular forms, uh, vernacular notions to describe antibiotics uh, as anti-inflammatory drugs, yake akse. Now, there was a problem in SOFA is that all the education material that, um, that came with the, uh, uh, with the clinical trial to inform the uh, participant the technical language, which was consequently not very well understood by the participants. As a consequence, also the test wasn't very well understood, but we'll come back to that. Um, what's more is that it's not just the language, but also the conceptions about illness and medicine, um, which, uh, which were contrary to expectations and collided to some extent with the assumptions of this biomarker test trial. The test assumes a distinction between bacteria and viruses. Now, the target population didn't normally uh, um, distinguish an illness between uh, having bacteria and viral causes. For them, it was often an inflammation of the body that was being cured. And consequently, it was quite difficult for them to follow the logic of what the test is doing. I go back to what this means then in terms of the implications on behavior. But suffice it to say that the assumptions were, uh, were not met uh, that we initially made as to the biomarker test. Now, the second point relates to the healthcare workers. Again, to the assumptions. Um, what do we assume healthcare workers to do when, uh, when they prescribe or not prescribe an antibiotic? Well, it turned out that by, uh, healthcare workers have, and in this case nurses, have very wide, a very wide portfolio of solutions and tactics that they deploy when they, uh, um, when they make decisions as to whether they should prescribe antibiotics or not. That's what you see here on the left-hand side of the slide, um, which maps out all the different tactics that nurses used. One of the tactics was, for instance, to prescribe um, herbal medicine in capsules as an alternative to antibiotics, and thereby satisfying also the demand for pharmaceuticals that patients exhibited in the absence of any diagnostic uh, technology like a CRP point of care test. Now, the CRP point of care test, however, was introduced into this existing network. It's not that nurses are naive and have 
no idea as to what to do and would compulsively prescribe antibiotics. It was much more nuanced than that. But introduced into this network, um, there would exist some tactics that are complementary to the test and some uh, tactics and strategies that are in conflict with the point of the CRP test. For instance, if the CRP point of care test suggests to the healthcare worker, to the nurse, that he or she should not prescribe an antibiotic, then that's quite synergistic, compatible with the idea of them providing a herbal medicine alternative to then not prescribe an antibiotic, but rather uh, something else, and to follow up on the recommendation of the test. These are synergies, but there are also conflicts. For instance, if a healthcare worker lives in a village, and then because of social pressure and social responsibilities almost, and ethical dilemmas, cannot simply not prescribe an antibiotic. And so the test then collides with uh, existing norms and practices that healthcare workers face, perhaps outside of their guidelines, but as part of their professional and social responsibility of being a community member. Now, this, um, these points tie together um, and link patients and healthcare workers and the test, which can have intended and unintended consequences. As far as the intended consequences go, um, everything we found was relatively consistent with the idea that the test seems to support the targeting of antibiotics towards uh, uh, fevers that have a bacterial cause and to reduce antibiotic prescriptions. So that by and large made sense also from a qualitative research perspective. However, it also had some unintended consequences that were not necessarily part of the, the trial design, not necessarily an objective of the test. For instance, what we saw is that um, introducing this test into the, uh, into the primary care setting in Thailand elevated the status of the health centers that, uh, that operated uh, this new di diagnostic tool. That can be a good thing if it stimulates uh, health, uh, public health care utilization and therefore more access to health care. However, there were also potentially negative consequences. For instance, this misinterpretation of the purpose of the test amongst patients. So patients might adhere more to the recommendation of the healthcare worker, but that might be because they think that everything is right with them if the test uh, provides a negative result, a low result. The healthcare worker would say, okay, everything is okay, the test said low. And the patient would understand, oh, everything is fine with me, I don't have, and now insert whatever you, you please, we heard diabetes, HIV, any illness at all. So uh, patients might change their behavior for the wrong reasons and think nothing is wrong with them, even though they might have a viral, viral infection that's not being picked up by this test. Now, at the moment, we can only speculate this. We, ha we, cannot follow, uh, we haven't followed up the patients in terms of th the consequence of this behavioral response, but it's a real risk that we need to, uh, uh, that we need to consider and something that social research here also has to document and to follow up on, and that social research should document. In any case, these were by and large some of the main findings from this paper focused on Northern Thailand. And I want to expand a little to the other research that we did. We also did a similar study, a similar analysis amongst patients in Yangon. And uh, we found similar patterns amongst the patients. For instance, that the test, uh, a negative test result, seems to uh, uh, attenuate the severity that, uh, with which people treat uh, their symptoms. So patients would think that actually this isn't as bad as they thought it would be if they get a negative CRP test result, even though that just means that it might just not be a bacterial infection. And similarly, we saw that patients uh, treat uh, the uh, operating um, doctors who use the CRP point of care test with more respect and uh, attributed a higher status to them um, because of uh, an more prolific technological environment that's being uh, provided to them. We also used the qualitative data from Thailand, from Myanmar, and also from a, from a related study in Vietnam and Hanoi um, that uh, used CRP point of care testing for acute respiratory infections and antibiotic prescription. Um, we used this data to carry out a comparative qualitative case study, uh, case study to understand what are the contextual factors that influence our interpretation of these clinical trials. And we, uh, we found ample evidence that there is, in fact, contextual influence on how we uh, understand the trial outcomes. I just want to give you some examples. For instance, if a healthcare worker, a doctor, a nurse thinks that the local epidemiological environment is very threatening from an infectious disease point of, uh, of view, 
then they might be more likely to override a negative test result that would suggest not to prescribe an antibiotic. If a healthcare worker, even though the, the CRP test says low, don't prescribe an antibiotic, thinks that a patient might contract pneumonia or TB, then they might want to err on the side of caution, even though epidemiological statistics might tell them otherwise. That's their local perception, and that might be very influential in how then uh, we see the results from such a biomarker test trial. Other things that were very influential was for, uh, were, for instance, the health system context. In Hanoi, healthcare workers experienced almost a glut of, uh, of antibiotics, uh, which uh, we could say compelled them even to dispense antibiotics because there were so many, they didn't know what to do with them. And in that case, a biomarker test to tell them not to prescribe antibiotics uh, was uh, arguably not as effective as it could be otherwise. Otherwise, as for instance in Thailand, where the policy environment had become much more restrictive and now healthcare workers have made complicated decisions, as it were, uh, regarding antibiotics, and the biomarker test helps them to direct uh, these decisions. So you can see how an intervention resonates with the complementary policy environment. And uh, we also went beyond qualitative, uh, qualitative data to understand the local context. In a related social research study, we carried out um, representative health behavior surveys in Chiang Rai, Northern Thailand, but also in Southern Laos, um, which uh, gave us an understanding of the local treatment seeking patterns and the role of fever in antibiotic consumption and demand from patients. Now it turned out that in Northern Thailand, fever is actually not necessarily a symptom for which people would expect to receive antibiotics. Maybe fever if it comes with other comorbidities, other symptoms like sore throat, or what people think is an inflammation. In that case, people in Chiang Rai would expect to receive antibiotics, but not for pure fever, which is in contrast to, for instance, Salawan in the neighboring country, uh, where 30% of our respondents, 30% of the rural population is representative data, would expect antibiotic treatment for fever. So you can see how the local population, uh, how population level treatment seeking patterns can give us a sense of what might be the impact of a biomarker test trial or any other clinical intervention um, for fever management uh, in the primary care sector, for instance. This data, by the way, also tells us where do people seek treatment from different healthcare providers, be they public, private or informal. And we're coming to an end here, um, and I, uh, I thank you already for your patience. Um, but I want to make two observations at this point. The first observation is the clinical trials, in my perspective, require social research to complement them in order to understand the social context in which they're being implemented, but also the consequences that come out of them. Understanding local context beforehand helps us to develop locally appropriate interventions that can have potentially the biggest bang for the buck, catering actually to population behaviors that might involve antibiotics or not, but also alongside the clinical trial to help us interpret the quantitative indicators that come out of the clinical trial more effectively, answering why questions. Why do healthcare workers and patients adhere or not adhere to a, uh, to a biomarker test? What does it actually mean to them? How does it change the behaviors? And we can also understand that the contextual influences better of how this, interact, uh, how this intervention um, influences healthcare workers and patients. Even in a single case study, this might give us in, uh, interesting information as to uh, what happens if parameters change, if, if the environment changes, if during seasonal change, during policy change, how might this influence, for instance, the sustainability of an, of an intervention? We are only just starting to collate more contextual understanding of, uh, of clinical interventions, and especially in the context of fever management and antimicrobial resistance, but I think it's vitally important. But similarly important is documenting these unforeseen social consequences that come from technological interventions. I repeat, from a social science perspective, we expect them. There's nothing surprising or nothing intrinsically bad about unforeseen positive and negative consequences of a clinical intervention. We expect them, they ought to be there. It would be weird if we don't find any. But it's the role of social sciences to document them and to inform the clinical sciences, the medicine as well, um, to help us monitor them and to mitigate the harms that, uh, that almost inevitably come with our interventions that also, try to, that also try to create good. In the worst case, we might not document the side effects, the negative side effects, and do more harm than good and not even know about it. And that might then be a real problem.
So that's the first point. The second point relates specifically to point of care tests, uh, CRP point of care testing for uh, antimicrobial resistance. And it turns out that their consequence, the social consequences are relatively similar to malaria rapid di diagnostic testing. Again, by and large, we see that they reduce antibiotic prescription. We, we see that improve antibiotic targeting, um, but especially this is the case when the policy environment is conducive. Out of context, there's not much point introducing and transplanting a point of care test if the, the context just doesn't work. Um, so there might be other constraints that prevent people from following up on, on low antibiotic prescriptions. And CRV point of care testing might not be the first point. But like malaria RDT testing, they're easily misunderstood by patients and they can, on the one hand, increase adherence, but it can also increase risky health behaviors. We could also argue that in, uh, in the context of public primary care interventions, um, the, uh, uh, the point of care tests uh, miss out a large part of the population who seek healthcare from pri uh, private providers and informal healthcare providers. But the conclusion I caution you should not necessarily be to expand the point of care testing to private healthcare and informal healthcare, because we might, be, we might actually end up increasing overall antibiotic use, um, because it's easy to misuse these point of care tests if they're non-specific and if it's the only um, point of care test that's being provided to, uh, to patients. Because it will also increase the status of private healthcare providers, it will legitimize informal healthcare providers, and even if it reduces antibiotic use, it might have a drive up the use of and prescription, inappropriate prescription of alternatives like NSAIDs, like steroids. So I, I would caution very, very uh, 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 passionately against rushing into extending um, point of care tests um, without taking, uh, doing proper due diligence beforehand among the private and in, among private and informal healthcare providers. So we come to the last slide. Um, what I want to say as concluding words is that fever-related treatment seeking is context specific. Now that's always true, but what it means is that we need to understand this context before we devise any interventions. And ideally we would do that um, with a lot of local knowledge, with a lot of local social scientists who understand the setting in which we want to intervene. We, want, we don't want to be uh, of white researchers, white medics and social scientists who tell people what to do. Um, Avoid, 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 and be uh, as local, as context sensitive as you can be. Because it might be that we devise interventions that might that succeed but for the wrong reasons and with problematic side effects that we don't understand and that we haven't foreseen. So in any case, um, I would recommend complementing your clinical research and fever management with social research and very early on in the design stage before you design any interventions. It's a, a mistake very often made and a mistake that often leads to frustration. Um, I hope uh, you see this as a positive note <laughs> rather than a negative note, um, but I very much encourage you uh, with your research endeavors, and I hope uh, this has given you some material for further discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Marco. We'll just turn the um, mics on for the audience if there's any questions. Yes, please. Sorry, I have one question. I was just curious. I 